so pleased to have been invited to participate in CBCF's annual legislative conference um, in this way, Leveraging Music for Change Universal Music Group's Task Force for Meaningful Change. Uh, I think this is a subject uh, that deserves uh, to have this kind of discussion. And so I'm very pleased uh, to attempt to bring to this discussion some of my understanding and appreciation uh, for, you know, this whole question of whether or not we can leverage music for change. From the Negro spiritual song uh, by the Fisk Jubilee Singers in the 1870s to popular socially conscious music of the 50s and 60s and 70s from artists like Nina Simone and uh, Billie Holiday to Public Enemy or NWA to contemporary artists like Kendrick Lamar. Music has been used to inspire, change, and advance social movement. Of course, we cannot talk about music and the advancement of uh, African Americans in music and the influence and the impact we've had without talking about Barry Gordy, who built a business only white men had been able to run. And of course, he had some of the most fantastic artists and without even going into, you know, talking about the Supremes and other, let me just mention Marvin Gaye, who encouraged us to question with what's going on. Indeed, Motown was at one of the greatest moments in our modern civil rights movement, a key driver of not just making black culture, American culture, uh, but in driving people to think differently about the world around them and to question the status quo. Rap and hip hop's very foundation is built upon the social strife of the black experience. Music has given voice to our stories, our joy, our sorrows, and our deep frustration and anger at injustice. Music is also universal and powerful and often translates or illuminates social issues and drives awareness among communities beyond our own. And so when we're gathering at the ALC to talk about how it is our time, our time to drive change and make a difference and be better, how can we not talk about music? I'm honored to introduce this panel of distinguished and talented leaders in the music community. Universal Music Group leads the music industry and two of their labels, Motown and Def Jam, certainly um, distinguishes, identifies uh, basically, you know, what we're all talking about and whether or not um, they are indeed synonymous with black culture and entertainment. Last year, Universal Music Group took the remarkable step of forming the Task Force for Meaningful Change, a group of top executives from around the globe focused on driving racial justice internally and externally in their conference rooms and in the streets. Today, we'll hear about their important work. Through artistry and corporate culture, we're united in pushing on the long acre of the moral universe to bend it towards justice. And there are lessons in their experience for all of us. It takes a movement for an organization or an industry or society to change and they're building that movement. So if now is the time, I want to welcome the moderator of our discussion, Dr. Mena DeMessi, the senior vice president and executive director of Universal Music Group's Task Force for Meaningful Change. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. I wanna also thank you for your enormous leadership every day uh, for decades that you have served in Congress and for the people of your constituency, but also uh, across the country. So thank you for your fierce leadership for progressive change and justice, equal rights, and of course, in your capacity um, as chair uh, of the Financial Services Committee. Um, it is my distinguished honor, everyone, to introduce to you uh, two 
forces to be reckoned with. Jeff Harleston, as you know, general counsel and EVP of business and legal affairs for UMG, also the interim chairman and CEO of Def Jam, and none other than the illustrious Ethiopia Haptamarium, chair and CEO of Motown Records. Uh, these two amazing leaders in the music industry um, have also equally been significant in their capacity using their platforms to advance social justice in the music industry. They both are co-chairs um, and pretty much co-founders of the Task Force for Meaningful Change, which really um, positioned UMG uh, across several labels to bring people together after the murder of George Floyd in June of 2020 um, to come together and use their platforms to say, what can we do to advance equity and justice, not only the Black community, but especially in the Black community across the country, whether we're talking about voting rights, whether we're talking about criminal justice reform, or whether we're talking about uh, advances that need to be made within the music industry. So it is an honor to have the three of you really engage in a conversation about uh, what do we use, what do we make of this moment in the post pandemic and uh, what do we make of the advances and also the challenges we're seeing with respect to social justice, um, you know, both in and outside of the music industry. So I really want to start with a general question about, um, you know, what has shaped your personal experiences that have led you to be passionate about social justice, often our earliest experiences in life, um, or even in later in life. Um, move us um, to use our platforms in this way. So I just love to hear what was that experience or set of experiences for you that has really called you to your own purpose of using your position to advance social justice? Well, um, this is a question that I've answered many times during my career. And I think most politicians are asked uh, from time to time, about their very early experiences and what motivated them to, you know, want to be in politics and what uh, have they worked on and what uh, do they see as a need to continue to work um, in particular areas. And of course, those of us who happen to be people of color are forever uh, going to be about the discussion of social justice in our country. As many people know, I come from St. Louis, Missouri. And I came from a huge family of uh, 13 uh, brothers and 12 brothers and sisters, 13 uh, children in our family. And so uh, we, of course, had to struggle uh, as most of the families in my community had to do. Uh, we certainly didn't have parents uh, who earned uh, large sums of money, uh, who had careers or jobs. Uh, and um, we didn't have social groups and organizations and nonprofits uh, that could really assist our families in acquiring whatever resources that should have been available or could have been available uh, to our families. And so we usually started uh, to work at a very young age. I started at about 12 years old. I worked in segregated restaurants. Uh, and of course, it was important for me to do not only uh, to earn money, but to ensure uh, that I had the kind of clothing uh, that was needed to return to school every September. And so I worked uh, at a very early age to ensure that I could go back to school uh, with the kind of clothing that I could be proud of and other kinds of small necessities uh, that families could not afford. And so I was reared uh, at a time uh, when I recognized uh, that, you know, people of color uh, were basically not on America's agenda uh, for correcting the problems that had emanated with slavery, for example. And so that's been a part of my life all through high school, all through my early careers, et cetera. What can I do uh, to increase opportunity and to get rid of racism and discrimination and uh, bring about justice and fairness? Uh, this is what I'm all about. This is what my life has been about. And I continue uh, down that path as a chair of the Financial Services Committee of the House of Representatives. This is what I do. And basically, in short, uh, this is what drives me and this is what inspires me. Knowing that uh, there has been injustice 
and a lack of opportunity. And once I and others like myself get in position, we must use that position uh, to not only be at the table to create influence, but we have to work very hard. We have to challenge in order to get our issues understood and appreciated. And um, it's hard work, uh, but this is what we do, not just me, but others who come from similar situations. Thank you, Congresswoman Ethiopia, Jeff. I'll let Jeff go. Okay. Um, yeah, I was born and raised in, in Boston, Massachusetts, which should be enough to, to drive any person of color to want to fight for equality. Uh, I, had, I went to, to, I was in high school in the uh, mid to late 70s. So um, that was a time of great uh, racial tension and strife. Uh, and and uh, uh, as a black, uh, young black uh, boy at that time, growing to be a man, um, in Boston, I, I learned very, very early on uh, the value of, of and as, as Congressman Waters so so eloquently referenced, justice and, and equality, and and a, a, a sense of fairness drove me um, most of my career, and it actually drove me to law school, uh, where where I uh, anticipated a a, a career uh, where I was going to be focusing on, on uh, it was, it was, uh, you know, litigation, but civil rights litigation. I did a bit of that when I first got out and somehow, it's a long story we don't have time for, ended up in the music business. Um, but, uh, but, but an underpinning of everything that, I've, that I, that I uh, uh, care about is the sense of fairness and justice. And, and uh, it is certainly not lost on me, the importance of, of music um, uh, to, the, to our community, not only as a source of, of strength um, and spiritual guidance, but also as a, as a, as a, um, as a uh, vehicle for expressing the, the, the concerns, the urgency, and in some instances, the necessity of, of bringing about change. Yeah, and I think that, you know, for, for myself, I'm first generation Ethiopian American. Um, my father was one of 10 kids that was chosen <laughs> to actually um, go to school back in Ethiopia. And he came to America on scholarship. And it's funny because my father being Ethiopian, he shared stories with me about how he never knew about racism back in Ethiopia. His friends that had come to America told him that the streets were paved of gold. And it was incredible. And so when he went to the University of Colorado, it was his first time back in the late 1960s, it was his first time um, learning of racism and experiencing it. So my father chose a path that um, curated a life for myself and my, my brothers um, that was all black everything. He chose to work at Tuskegee University where he became the Dean of Veterinary Medicine for many years. Uh, I grew up in Tuskegee and I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. And music for me was the connection point to, to the other communities that I experienced being a, a child of immigrants. And my father, I remember him um, checking me out of school to hear Jesse Jackson speak when he was coming to the university or Farrakhan or, or whoever it was. And so I, I give credit to my father for really teaching me the power of responsibility um, and how we show up for our community. And that's been his authentic path and it's been mine as well. Growing up in Atlanta and starting in the music business pretty early because of my passion and love for music, um, I, I came across many individuals that mm -hmm. did the work in their everyday in their everyday job. It was how we were moving and advancing as a community. And, Music is an art form that allows us to share our stories, but it also brings people together and educates at the same time. And so it's just been a part of my authentic walk. And so I give credit to my father. I also give credit to my mentor, Clarence Avant, who I had the opportunity to meet over 15 years ago, who would always drive home the point, the power of responsibility. And he led um, in a very honest way and he fought hard and, and I suggest everyone check out his documentary on Netflix as well to learn about his journey, but we follow in his path and we're, we're, we're proud descendants of Mr. Avon. I know Jeff, Jeff says that as well. Thank you, Ethiopia. Go ahead. Uh, yes, so um, here's the thing too, Ethiopia, you're kind of tapping into this 
piece about mentorship and connectivity and networks and how, you know, uh, community and change happens with community. And so I want to ask you, Ethiopia and Jeff, before turning to the Congresswoman on really the music industry and the roles that you all have played, especially with the inception of the Task Force for Meaningful Change. We know that um, there was sort of a, an awakening that the country experienced after George Floyd's murder, although a lot of us know these issues of racial injustice and police brutality is not new to us. Um, and so, you know, we witnessed the music industry pivot um, and really sent, recenter these issues. Uh, in particular, in your both capacities, we have the UMG's Task Force for Meaningful Change. And I would love for the two of you to just share, you know, what um, the influence, the task force, what was that like coming together to really be, walk the walk and be the change we wanna see? What has that experience look like? What has been the advances that have been made? And then I wanna to turn to the Congresswoman to talk about from her vantage point, the importance of, um, people in the music industry, artists, executives, using their positions to advance policy in Congress. So Ethiopia, Jeff, talk to us about the Task Force for Meaningful Change. Well, uh, the Task Force was born um, out of the series of events culminating in the, the murder of George Floyd and, and a, a strong desire uh, for for us as a company to do something. And, and I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy and proud to say that that it, it was something that came out of the mouth of our chairman, who's not a person of color. Um, but he asked uh, Ethiopia and I to put this task force together and uh, to address our response. And, and we came together over that fateful weekend and, and sat on the phone and, and mapped out uh, this task force. And what was really clear from the beginning was we added the term meaningful change and the meaningful change part means a lot because it's what it, what it, what we wanted to make sure is that it wasn't about the summer of 2020. It wasn't about the murder of George Floyd or Ahmaud Arbery or, or, or Brianna or any of those people. It was really about doing something meaningful. So we don't have to go through this again. I don't want my kids to have to go through this again. I don't want their kids to have to go through this again. And what can we do that can be institutional in nature? And, and one of the challenges we had was, um, you know, at the time, and, and, and even I think it exists today, um, you know, a lot of the youth want it now. They want, it, they want an immediacy to what was happening. Um, what can we do? Front lines, when are we, when are we marching? Burn it all down. Um, and all of those emotions, I think, um, were real and, 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 and accurate and, and important, but we had to find a way to marry those, those feelings with some of the more longer term institutional changes we could. And, and we, we put together a variety of, of what became committees uh, within the, the task force to address issues ranging from voting rights and, and other legislative initiatives that we could get behind to um, issues within our own company in terms of uh, recruitment, hiring, retention, mentorship of black employees. Um, we, we had one committee, we have one committee that's, that's designed to partner with our artists to provide opportunities for them to, to amplify their voice in their communities. And so we're able to work with artists on various initiatives in their communities um, around the country. And one thing that, I, that, I, that I'm most proud about is that we, we you know, we're a global company and we looked at the issue as a global issue. And we included um, colleagues from uh, South Africa, uh, the UK, Canada, Brazil, um, a variety of, of, of different territories because the issues sadly are not unique to the United States, but, but it gave us a, a chance to really make a footprint. E, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to talk about some of the initiatives in particular. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, just to, circle back on Jeff's point about how we came together. I think it was important to recognize that the black employees within our organization also, you know, we had hit a bit of a tipping point where, you know, the pandemic was happening, Ahmaud Aubrey and George Floyd, but, you know, the show must be paused came along and created that pause where we all got the chance to come together and really internally talk about the issues that we wanted to address understanding the importance of music and the value of music around the world, as Jeff pointed out. Um, 
we we held a responsibility for not only our employees and our executives, but also to the artists, to the community, um, to our partners. So we made sure that we had conversations with our artists. We had conversations within each business unit of the organization and also with our partners to talk about what we could do to really create meaningful change, as Jeff pointed out. And so um, there is the global, uh, their task force within around the world. There's also the work that we're doing within the community. We did uh, charitable giving and aid there. And then we also, um, we've done a ton of community activations and also addressed um, internal changes. How do we grow other black executives in the music industry that can lead from a C-suite perspective? And so there's been a lot of work that's been done. I think that we all realize that it's not something that can happen overnight, but we have a team of executives and employees that are committed to doing the actual work. And we're really proud of that. Wonderful. Uh, Congresswoman, I want to turn it over to you. I have a two-part question. One is sort of from your vantage point, especially, uh, you know, representing California, Los Angeles in particular, what have you seen in terms of the ways in which artists and the music industry um, and executives can use their platforms to advance things they care about? Um, you know, and then the second is what have you witnessed in terms of the change uh, with your colleagues in Congress? I mean, you have earned the endeared name Auntie Maxine, um, and, and you have because you are there to respond to the needs of the people regardless of what anyone else is doing. And that's really what progressive change is about. And so you have been there answering the call to justice, whether it was you know, racism, uh, police brutality, what have you. And now you know it's about uh, the collectivity of your colleagues coming together. So part A is so to what how can artists and executives continue to support uh, leaders like you who have um, the bully pulpit of Congress to make change? And then what have you witnessed um, in terms of the shifts Congress has made to focus on these issues of injustice within the black community? Okay, let me just say that throughout history, uh, black artists in different ways have been supportive of community efforts and they've done it in different ways. We had black artists who were not earning huge sums of money uh, that refused to perform um, in certain racist states. Years ago, uh, we've had artists who have contributed their money mightily to big movements like uh, South freeing Nelson Mandela and getting rid of apartheid in South Africa. We've had artists who love Dr. Martin Luther King, walked with him, followed him, marched with him, uh, gave their money to them. Uh, we've had artists who, you know, supported uh, some who were involved with the Black Panthers even, supported Angela Davis and on and on and on. So we must give credit uh, to the fact that we have had many artists and particularly artists, black artists who have in their own way contributed uh, to the struggle for justice and equality. And I'm remembering uh, something about Ray Charles and the money that he left, you know, to one of our uh, very important black uh, educational institutions. Um, and so again, credit is due. Uh, to those efforts that have been made uh, by many Black artists. And then there are others who are not Black artists who have contributed, who have been, been very much involved in politics, whether it's Barbara Streisand or many others that I, I can think about. Uh, you know, I just, um, I just saw Marla Gibbs, you know, just had an opportunity uh, to witness her getting her star, you know, uh, on the, the uh, Walk of Fame in Hollywood. And of course she had with her um, the producer of the Jeffersons uh, and you all know his name and I'm trying to think of it right now, a very, very prominent uh, in the, in the uh, entertainment industry who came up with those kinds of productions uh, that helped to um, you know, talk about uh, racism in some very interesting ways and uh, who helped to promote you know, these sitcoms, that's it, Norman Lear. <laughs> Norman Lear was there with her. And uh, of course, I know both of them and have known them for years. And I was pleased that he was there with, uh, with her as she was getting her, uh, you know, her star on the, on the Walk of Fame. And so let's just 
at least be able to conclude that there have been efforts by many uh, over the years uh, to give support uh, to artists, whether we're talking about the music industry or we're talking about uh, the, the movie industry, et cetera. And so what uh, do I think uh, can be done even more? Uh, first of all, we get many of our artists to come to the Congress of the United States and they will give testimony uh, on some issues that they care about, that they've been involved in. And sometimes we get the testimony and it is um, you know, supported by their management, et cetera. And then it goes away. Uh, and that one moment uh, that they had was not followed up with uh, was not um, improved upon in some ways. And I've oftentimes wondered about that and wondered what can we do uh, to keep those who have shown some interest or who've been encouraged by management in some way? What can we do to keep them involved uh, in ways that uh, they can you know, be in the forefront at, 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 at particular times? The other thing is, you know, uh, the artists have to think about whom they are, what they do, and it's a career. And so we have to understand uh, that they're under management and that for management, it's a career uh, to provide the management and they can't always be where we want them to be all the time. Uh, they are working uh, to make a living and the management is doing that. So we have to think about that and not just pounce on them uh, to do everything we may want them to do when we want them to do it. But what I think we can do a better job of, we can do a better job of convincing them uh, to step into some of the areas that may be seen as a little bit too hot to handle. Um, but you know, it's where we really do need them and which of them have demonstrated that they're willing uh, to step into some of the very controversial areas because they are well positioned. Like uh, Sam Jackson, I believe it is, for example, who will you know, step out and say things that nobody else would say <laughs> and um, you know, follow it up, you know, but he's got it made. I mean, his career has been absolutely solidified. And so he can do that. Not all artists can do that. Um, but we have a number that fall into that category. And I think what we need to do a little bit better is we need to be able as elected officials to meet with management and artists and talk about these issues. What are we doing on police reform? And why does it frighten them when they think coming out of that is defund the police? Their artists can't take that. Their management can't take that. It does not really work. Uh, in the way that would be helpful to them and even maybe harmful to them. But how do we help them to frame that? There's a way that you can define uh, what it means when those people are saying about defund the police and define it in ways that they won't think is zero out the police, but it's doing what could be doing to credibly look at the budgets and see how much money is being spent on overtime that may be more money than their actual salaries. And is that really needed? Uh, take a look at what happens when uh, the uh, Police Protective League is lobbying the members of the city council for more benefits and for higher pay. And take a look at that and see if the higher pay that is being given to police office uh, is absolutely uh, extraordinarily higher uh, than pay that's been given in, if you could call lack industries of security, et cetera. And talk about how you could credibly look at the budgets and you can get support from the community on how you go about saying, we think that in this budget, there's a lot of fat. And of this fat, we can take, you know, uh, a few million dollars out of here and we can apply to uh, the children's program or the seniors program, et cetera. But that kind of conversation does not really take place. And what you have is you have artists who are busy you know, with, uh, uh, with what they do, and they don't get uh, all of the intricacies of the issue. And you have management who may not get all of the intricacies of the issue, but also management who has a responsibility 
uh, to protect the artist and make sure uh, that they don't fall backwards into something that they had not intended to fall into. So those kind of conversations don't really go on. They don't happen. And we need to find a way by which to talk with management and artists about some of these issues. Um, the other thing is this, you know, those of us in the black community, yes, we're mostly Democrats. And we're mostly Democrats because we know how to act in our best interest. Even if we're not getting everything that we need, we keep advancing our issues and we keep moving forward. And so we're mostly Democrats because that's where our best interests are. Not, not everybody is a, is a Democrat. And in the, um, in the music industry, not everybody's a Democrat, not management's already a Democrat, but for the better part of the black music industry, they are on the side of Democrats. And so money is extremely important to everybody. Money is important to the art artists, money is important to the management, and it's to all of us to get reelected to office. And for those of us, who can't raise money, uh, basically in our communities, they don't really have the money in certain parts of the community. And we have to look to others to help fund our campaigns. Then we're also looking to the interest of others uh, because that's who you know, know that they have some power and influence. What would happen if in fact, just as the music industry has organized on some of the big issues and they've done some of these great big, um, productions um, where they have gotten together and those productions have gone to all of the common interests that they may have. And we've seen some of that. And you, you know, you're all young on this platform, but if you can think about the ways that uh, everybody from Belafonte and, uh, um, you know, uh, all of our big artists came together around a couple of those great big productions. And if you can think about what they were and remember that, then what would happen if such a big production was put together on behalf of the democratic agenda that you would agree upon? And that money was divided among all of those Democrats who have to work very hard in order to keep these districts, in order to have a voice. Because I wanna tell you, when you are controversial, then the money comes in against you. You know, the right wingers, you know, you're talking about, we're dealing with domestic terrorists now. We're dealing with the Proud Boys. We're dealing with the Oath Keepers. We're dealing with QAnon. We're dealing with the KKK still, and they raise millions of dollars. My last opponent, for example, had $10 million, a black Republican who came after me and I'm, you know, knowing, yes, I'm in a democratic district, but how do I let them know that we're in danger? How do I let them know it costs money, you know, to do that? And so what I'm saying is, as we look at the power and the influence, great, one great production every two years for members of Congress would be fabulous. So I want you to think about that. Uh, and I want us to think about how we can better be interpreters of the issues and help to, you know, get into the intricacies of the issues so people can understand it better and not think they're just running out there in a way that may jeopardize them, et cetera. These are some of the tough things to have to think about, but it's real. Yes, Congresswoman, you are speaking truth to power on so <laughs> many levels. And, you know, it really makes us think about, you know, when it comes to injustice, and we often say when Black America does better, all of America does better, but you have to be bold, you have to be unapologetic, and getting Black people free has never been easy. And so, you know, we need to look to you as an example of, you know, the fact that this is going to be a tough road, but if we don't do it, who's going to do it? And, um, you know, one of the great things uh, in my capacity uh, supporting Ethiopia and Jeff's vision for the task force is really putting resources behind it, being bold, uh, financially supporting marginalized organizations through trust-based philanthropy, letting organizations decide where they can best use their funds, but also using their position, to your point, to leverage um, 
everyone together to advance these issues. It's such a great, important point you're calling upon the responsibility of managers and artists to step up and, and cultivate that culture so people feel em empowered and not fearful of using their platform for social change. We, we actually um, uh, created the Alliance uh, for Criminal Justice Reform in the music industry with artists and athletes um, you know, just recently uh, and um, in mid-May leveraged all of our partners in the industry to push for the advancement and passage of the justice, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And, um, and it's a great example of the importance to work with athletes, artists, everyone who can push the platform. But it's, it, it's, it's ironic, right, that in this awakening the country has had, we still, it's, it's like a bold thing to pass this bill. <laughs> when, when we know that if we want to save Black lives, um, the least we can do is pass the bill, right? Like the least we can do. We haven't even really started on that path. And so I, I think it's such an important point. And I, I want to pivot to, to Jeff and Ethiopia to talk about what have you all witnessed um, in your positions in the industry in terms of, of artists and the power of, of Black music and, and music to activate change. It's, it, you know, we have so many stories and examples of that. What are you witnessing um, in terms of the changes and shifts you're seeing in the industry to really speak to what the Congresswoman is talking about and focus on these issues of criminal justice reform, voting rights, and what have you? Well, I think, I think uh, Congressman Waters brought up a really important point about, about uh, uh, taking your voice to the next level and really you know, providing a level of support that's 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 really effective, both in in you know obviously financial support, but also being able to understand and translate. And you know what I've seen is um, a number of you know black, a number of black artists you know, historically have been wonderful at at using uh, their medium and sometimes their celebrity to communicate messages um, that 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 lead to conversation. Because I do think that that the uncomfortable conversations are where change really happens. Um, and, you know, we saw this, uh, you know, 30 years ago, 25 years ago with, with artists like Public Enemy, who really, you know, brought, brought a, a, an, an energy and an urgency to their messaging that still resonates today. Um, and, and you see it in, you know, in, in certainly current, uh, very popular artists like Kendrick Lamar and, and uh, J. Cole, who, uh, just to name a few, there's many, but, but, but certainly have have wonderfully woven some of these themes in, in, into, into their music to try and, and, and get the message across. One thing that sticks out to me though, um, and, and it was really poignant to, to, to witness last year was, um, we have a, a, a black singer who is signed to our country music label in Nashville. Nashville. Her name is Mickey Guyton. And she wrote a song called Black Like Me. And, and um, it was a very, I saw her speak at a panel and it was, and it was, it touched me and, and moved me to this day as she talked about some of the experiences she's had in that arena where she has um, had people wave Confederate flags at her while she's performing, um, people uh, lodge racial epithets at her while she's performing um, and, and how, how it's been very hard in, in that particular music community um, but how she felt it was her it was her responsibility and duty to um, to come with the song uh, Black Like Me and it's and it's a you know it, it's that kind of courage that I think that we need to encourage in our in all of our artists um, to 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 uh, forward the conversations. Yeah, and I, I agree with you, Jeff. And also, I want to thank Congresswoman Waters for some of the suggestions that you put forward, because we often talk about how do we provide um, more education and information to our artists, right? So they know how they can show up and really use their platform in a positive way to create change. And I think some of the ideas you put forward are, are, are definitely interesting. But we also bring up the point of mentorship. We also talk about mentorship within you know our company and with employees and growing executives but you realize that artists also need mentorship when they want to understand how to show up to help make change and use their influence um we saw something last year as well with one of our artists and listen you know motown is this label that has always been a part of 
change and also building bridges of understanding. And uh, last year, one of our artists, Little Baby, who you know, is through our partners at Quality Control, when the riots were happening and knowing his influence in hip hop and in music and in the city of Atlanta specifically, there were riots happening. And I remember um, Mayor Bottoms had reached out and wanted him to really help in, in stopping some of what was happening, some of the looting and things of that sort. And he took it upon himself to really get out there within the community to educate himself on what was really happening. And he went and created a record called The Bigger Picture that most people wouldn't expect from him as they saw him through a certain lens. But he got out in the community, met with city council members and was understanding the plight of his community and his, and his, his people. And he went and created a song that spoke to so many people and it created a bridge of understanding. And so we under we know that our artists have an opportunity and we've seen it happen over and over again, right? When artists speak about what's happening in community and can help ed educate other communities so that there's some understanding. I think that it's really important that um, going back to your original question, Mena, for, for Congressman, Congressman, Congresswoman Waters, um, about how artists can show up that, that we as these major music companies can help provide these resources for them so they can do what they need to do to really make change. And so we understand our responsibility in that and look forward to working with you all and creating those opportunities. Actually, what we've been talking about is on two different levels. One is, you know, public policy making as it is done in these legislative bodies and understanding where you can have some influence. And oftentimes, uh, aside from, you know, testifying at a committee hearing or uh, getting together with a group of legislators uh, to talk about uh, what's going on. And, you know, for example, when you talk about police reform, you know, what's hanging up the bill is qualified immunity. And probably they don't talk about that a lot. And, you know, uh, that needs to, to be discussed because at some point in time, some decisions are going to have to be made about uh, the role that, you know, qual qualified immunity is playing in this legislation. Uh, the other thing is, look, our young people love our artists and they love the music. They love everything. They all want to be just like the artists. We have all kinds of little studios throughout the community where they're getting together and they want to be, um, they want, they want, they love hip hop and they love rap. And so they are practicing, all of them think that they can do it better than Kendrick Lamar and on and on and on. Uh, but I would like to see more artists do what Kendrick Lamar does. Now, Kendrick is in the community. He's in the public housing projects in Watts. And he puts on his own little concerts and stuff down there for them. He even went so far as to have pay the rent, you know, for um, many of those in public housing uh, before we got to rental assistance. Uh, he did this and I, I, I know about him and I know, you know, what, what he's done. Not everybody, has that kind of basic background and would do that. But I want to tell you what would happen if, you know, an artist showed up in a community where they have these little studios that they're put together, that they're working with, and just come and give them a word of advice, you know, and tell them what they went through and, you know, kind of how it all works. That is really very good because I want to tell you, aside from helping the artist, you're helping the whole community. The more we invest in this human potential, the less problems we have, the less people think that nobody care about them, the less they're willing to do things that, you know, certainly are not good for themselves or for the community. So artists are extraordinarily important uh, in the eyes of uh, young people. And uh, I've been doing something called Young, Gifted and Black for ever since I've been in Congress. Young, Gifted and Black is part of the legislative uh, the Black Caucus Legislative Conference was all about that in the beginning, to say to elected officials and those in Congress, these are our children. I mean, they didn't drop down out of Mars someplace. And when you talk about censorship, I don't think you know what you're talking about. You may not like the words of gangster rap, but don't listen to it. You know what I mean? Tell your kids don't listen to it, but don't say that they don't have a right uh, to say what they feel and what they want to do. And I was right, because as it has evolved, many of them 
who were considered just hardcore gangster rappers have now evolved. They're producing, they've created a lot of jobs. And, you know, I've seen some of our young women in, um, you know, hip hop who are now, you know, sing jazz and producing. And I mean, it's just been wonderful to watch the growth, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with rap and in the entire hip hop community, whether we're talking about music or clothing and the influence that we've had. And so it's a part of our economy, a serious part of our economy. We support it and we need all the support we can get uh, from them. So uh, this discussion is worthwhile. It should continue and let's step outside of the box and let's get some members of the Black Caucus to come and meet with some artists it does not have to be big, you know, stuff, programs. We're talking about, okay, let's get, you know, three or four at a time uh, and let's get, you know, on either side and let's be very serious about gearing in on the issues as we understand it and what public policy is all about and how it operates and how they can have more influence in it and how the artists themselves just by I don't see, uh, for example, uh, many artists going into, you know, the black community, but you know, a lot of people don't, you know, they, they don't, when they come in, when, if they happen to come into South Central uh, LA these days is, wow, this is deep. <laughs> this is deep going into, you mean to tell me, you know, you walk through Watts and you're not, well, come on, you know, but let's, let's see what we could do in small groups uh, that would take time out. Let's talk to each other and let's help us to understand how we can both be more instrumental in doing what we want to do. And that is creating opportunities for justice and equality. We have to give credit to the Clarence A. Vance and the Barry Gordys and all of you who have worked in this industry. Uh, and we have to understand the role that some politicians have played. Jesse Jackson had a great relationship uh, with the music, black music industry, and he used it very well. And they responded to him very well. And so all we have to do is kind of look at some of the things that have happened in the past and keep it going, improve upon it and create new ways by which to talk to each other. Thank you very much. Amen, Congresswoman. This is actually <laughs> a wonderful segue to, to sort of closing comments and we appreciate the call to action. Um, we are uh, very honored to be in esteemed company. I personally, uh, being able to be behind the scenes at UMG supporting Ethiopia and Jeff in this capacity, and we're only going to get bigger and better from here. Um, and, and on that note, I want to turn it over to, to Jeff in Ethiopia for any closing remarks. All I'll say is it, it's, a, it's been a great opportunity in, to be here and, and share with you, Congressman Waters. and, and um, you dropped many a jewel today uh, that, that we will take back for sure. Um, and, and I love the idea of particularly of, because um, it goes to something Ethiopia men, made, mentioned earlier about mentorship, but the, the, to, to be able to have some artists come in and, and liaise with the, uh, with the Congressional Black Caucus, I think would be wildly, wildly important. And so uh, that's something I, I will, I support wholeheartedly and we'll, and we'll work to try and bring about. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Waters. This has been a pleasure and, and we are excited to continue the conversation and to work with the CBC to really provide solutions and, and use our influence in a positive way. Thank you so much. Thank you, You're so welcome and thank you for having me on today. I appreciate it. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for making time and, and, and more importantly for using all of your platforms this way. And to your point, Congresswoman, it all matters whether you know, you're know you having meetings in the background or on the front lines, it, it, all, it all matters. The Task Force for Meaningful Change uh, will continue its due diligence and its work in this capacity, uh, whether it's on voting rights, criminal justice reform, uh, or getting the artists to uh, feel that they're empowered and supported to be the change they want to see. So thank you all so much. Um, and we look forward to the work ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.